Just leading up before the um, before we went to the Paralympics, I was um, working in a job that I wasn't really happy, and I was came up from Rotorua after doing the business college. I got a job at Smith and Brown as a dictaphone typist because that's what blind women in particular did: dictaphone typing or switchboard operating. So I, I did the dictaphone typing. It was a job. It meant I could, you know, we 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 had a flat by then, so I had to have a I had to have a job. <laughs> but then I got sick of that. I thought, oh no, this is boring. I can't be doing this. Then I thought, okay. I can know the the best thing for me to do is to just find something else completely different. So I went and did a computer programming course. So consequently I'm still to this day, you know, looking out for new new technologies and new ways to do things more effectively and efficiently as a manager for for Vision Pacific Trust and uh, but also for other DPOs that can use it. Welcome to Generations of Change. I'm Anya Kelly Costello, a young blind journalist and advocate known for my delight in asking endless questions. I mainly grew up in the 2000s, and I vividly remember the camaraderie of being at camps with other blind kids and teens. In the real world at school, I was surrounded by sighted people. I was a good student, but I remember the shame I felt when a teacher asked me why I was sitting alone at lunch, and the frustration of having to fight to be in the jazz band just because I couldn't see. While at uni, I stumbled into a role advocating for accessibility law. Suddenly, it was my job to connect with and empower other disabled people to be part of a call for change, and I had to find the courage to build relationships with a whole lot of virtual strangers. That job would end up bringing me into community and solidarity with students, writers, academics, business people, and advocates of all ages. Disability was our shared experience, and together we would champion change. Our efforts built on decades of leadership from disabled people. But how was it growing up disabled 40 or 50 years ago, or acquiring disability as an adult? How has Aotearoa changed? How has it not? What unplanned moments would shape the lives of the visionary disabled people who dedicated themselves to making inclusion the norm? Join me for one of seven conversations where both of us get to find out. Kia ora tūai. it's so good to be able to talk to you today. Um, could you just introduce yourself for me? I'm um, Te Wai, skip with Halato. I'm from Rotorua, that's where my family home is. But I live here in Auckland and work here since uh, 1980. So I'm part of a large family. I've got uh, five brothers and four sisters and my father's no longer with us, and but mum is to this to this day, and she's raised this this large family um, amongst which I had to uh, get along. You know, it, it being I'm number seven of ten, and uh, I lost my sight through a retinoblastoma when I was about four years old, and that meant that I my parents made the decision after meeting with the foundation welfare officer at that time that I should go to the Blind Foundation for education which meant boarding away from home so being part of that larger whānau meant that I it, I think it gave me the resilience to sort of hold my own amongst uh, your siblings and when I went to boarding school, I think I was like that with the others that were there. They, of course, became your your extended family. And uh, even though <clears throat> you miss home as a a kid going away to and and boarding, you know you 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 find um, your your friends that that have been lifelong friends. For you know, I've got lifelong friends from going back to when I'm. Um, you know, when I was five years old. Yeah, that's really special. Was your family still in, was it Rotorua when you were going to boarding school? Yes, and I used to go home for holidays. It was difficult, you know, um, 
I can still remember day one when, when my parents brought me up to when I was five. I, I, I can still remember kicking my feet up on, you know, throwing a tantrum on the hall floor. <laughs> but, you know, you just had to get on and after a few days you settle down and the homesickness goes initially and then you get into the routine. And in primary school, is this, is this sort of like the 50s or 60s where... What, what time period are oh, we? In the 60s, because so, um, when I started at Parnell, that would have been 62, I think it was. And then we moved to Homer College, I think, in 64. And at that point, did, did your parents or did your whanau feel like they had a choice about where you went to school? Or was it very much that blind children were expected to sort of go to Parnell and Homai? Probably leaning when I was four-ish, four and a half, something like that. I did go to school with my siblings, with my sister and my younger brother. And I remember being in class and they were giving out books and pencils for the kids to draw with and I didn't know what to do with them. So I think I realised then that, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know what to, how to do, what to do, how to deal with this. Mm. So I think then it was probably a, a sort of a realisation that, Oh, I, I, I don't really, I can't play with the kids in the same way that they're playing. I learned so much from um, being at boarding school. So when we have these discussions about special education versus mainstream and special schools versus um, community-based education, and I, I can sort of see both sides because even prior to going to high school when I was still at at Homer College and probably around about intermediate school t age. They had, you know, cooking, we learned how to cook. They had woodwork classes, we had fantastic games um, that our PE teacher would devise that involved roller skating or um, throwing balls. I really think that I wouldn't have learned any of those things if I wasn't in that kind of special school setting. That sounds like a lot of fun, which is interesting comparing that to my memories of PE growing up being at the class where I was always having to think about how I could adapt so that mm. I could fit in with, you know, my sided peers and always trying to think of ways to do things. Yeah, year when, six being, you know, we played dodgeball and things like that yeah. and I just remember hating it. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, because I, I was like that too because I'd loved PE when, when I was at home, I, uh, you know, through primary and intermediate years. But when I went to high school and I couldn't fit in with the others doing PE with the mainstream class and I used to try and do my best to dodge it really, to try and get out of it somehow because I knew I wasn't keeping up or doing... You know, things had to be modified or had to be accommodated somehow, which was sort of holding up the rest of the class. Were there other people in your year in high school who were blind? Oh, yes. And of course, they had the resource centre at, at uh, Manirewa High School, one class for the sort of low vision uh, students and then, and then the other where, where the, the blind students would... Uh, hang out and go and get, you know, store our humongous volumes of yes. maths books and all this kind of thing. Right, that's mm. really interesting. So yeah. in high school, did you get a combination then of staying in the hostel in the special education environment but yeah. being mainstreamed through high school, was it? Exactly, that's what it was, yeah. We experienced walking to school similar to the other kids. They were walking from their homes to the high school, so we we took our pack lunches, which were like other kids. We either swapped them or kept them. <laughs> we sort of had that mainstream interaction, so to speak, and um, but we also had the the backing of the special school setting because we came back from high school each day. We had to do homework. We we had they uh, we had to do what they call prep and they'd bring in um, teachers from the high school to, to give us coaching lessons and, and uh, extra tuition. Oh, we had to keep our own rooms. This is when I was at high school. We had to learn how to clean the toilet. We had to learn how to iron our clothes, mop the floors. We learned to make our own suppers and that sort of thing. See, and this is embarrassing, but I still don't know how to iron. Um. 
<laughs> and you know that that sounds like a sort of thing that it would have been really useful to learn at school, yes. actually <laughs> when you would have transitioned to high school i guess that would have been um coming to terms with seeing like your blindness from the point of view of the sighted kids more mm. for the first time i was certainly aware that my my perkins brailler which i had to carry to class was was noisy so you had to try you try and uh, work your braille machine so that it doesn't make too much noise to distract the rest of the class <laughs> which is just about impossible you become aware of how difficult it is socially to find a spot to sit something as basic as that i mean how do you find a spot to sit to eat your lunch and then how do you know who's around you and you become so aware of what accommodations you need, if any, or how you're putting people out. And so I guess you become a lot more self-conscious in that sense. Yes, very self-conscious. That's part of, I think, teenage years too, and so you sort of, it's all amplified. Yeah, totally. But, um, you know, I did have friends that would, um, I, I could go and, like, if, if I set it up, if I set it in the class just before lunch, I'd say, well, where, where are you going to have lunch, you know, so that I could go back dump my books and so on and then take my lunch to if they're there or to the spot where they said they'll be. I really enjoyed it because I liked making friends outside of the the hostel friends. But so what, just, did you, what did you do when you finished school? When I finished? Mm. Yeah, when I finished school I, went, I did a year at uh, Rotorua High School where they had brought in a, a business college course so it's uh, typing, business, what do they call it? It's like uh, economics. Um, well, they taught shorthand, of course, because that was still in then. This is in 1976. And what was that? Was that a course that you wanted to do or did you just feel like you needed to do something and that was that was available? Yeah, pretty much. But it was and it was a it was a good course because um, I found it very easy actually and I think that was because of the, I figured that it was because of the standard of education that I had had at high school because I, I, I actually was top of the class. Mm. I announced to my parents that I was going to move to Auckland to, to live with my boyfriend who's now my husband and um, so that's what I did. And was that about the point when you would have started training in track and field? stuff as well we were we were still involved in the cricket club and the hockey club this is through the you know the, our, our blind network hmm. of clubs and then we somehow we got on to um, athletics and and they found us a coach and the next thing we know we were put going along to uh, athletic meetings in New Zealand and Australia. We went to uh, a, a games over in Australia, won some medals and then we kept on and and then we were selected for the, well I was selected to go for track and field to the 1980 Paralympics in, in Arnhem in Netherlands and uh, I got a bronze in the discus there. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> And uh, so that was a, that was great, but I didn't pursue any more of the um, athletics. But then we very much saw sport as when I say we, I'm still talking about Latour and myself. We very much saw sp sport as a as a way of giving you know of a person feeling good about themselves and through through exercise and whatever it was, whether it was lifting weights or whether it was, uh, yeah, any, any kind of um, exercise and sport that they, people want, you know, that a person would identify that they wanted to pursue. In the 80s, we started, we advocated to the, Latour and I, we, we both advocated for the setting up of a gym along with some other friends. We, we started the first, got the first gym at the Parnell campus set up. Wow. Yeah, and um, then the gym was accepted as part of the recreation program for the foundation. There's still a gym at Afina uh, House today. Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> but also at the same time, we were um, talking with some um, others too about Māori and Pacific 
needs and so we were founders of um, Ngāti Kāpō back then which is now Kāpō Māori. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of prompted or encouraged you and La to, to put the time into making that happen? Just leading up before the um, before we went to the Paralympics I was um, working in a job that I wasn't really happy and I was I were basically I after I came I came up from Rotorua after doing the business college. I got a job at Smith and Brown as a dictaphone typist because that's what blind women in particular did. Mm -hmm. Either dictaphone typing or switchboard operating. So I, I did the dictaphone typing. It was a job. It meant I could, you know, we 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 had a flat by then, so I had to have a I had to have a job. <laughs> but then I got sick of that. I thought, oh no, this is boring. I can't be doing this. Then I thought, okay. I can know the the best thing for me to do is to just find something else completely different. So I went and did a computer programming course. I gave it a go and found out that I wasn't so good at that. So then I thought I'll go to uni and do intermediate law. And then during that year, they they I heard about the, a social work course that was starting up at um, what was then Epsom Training College. So I dropped the idea of law school and, and went switched to social work. We started being exposed to all kinds of um, rights and advocacy issues and political. That the, the, the basis of the course really was to teach you how to, to analyze things from a systems um, point of view from a political analysis. And I guess that's a skill set that you've continued to use. Was that around the time when you would have gotten into founding Vision Pacific? Was that uh, later? No, Vision Pacific came along in the 90s because um, cause by that time um, we were getting requests from uh, organisations in the, around the Pacific, you know, how do you build the capacity of, of our committees? How do you run your office? What's what's governance mean? All those sorts of things, or or it could be like, or how do you do it as a blind person? Because a lot of the backroom stuff that you need yeah. for organisations to yes. be able to function yes. at all. You helped to found the Pacific Disability Forum as well, yes. right? It's basically a structure for organisations from mm. around the Pacific all around to the Pacific, do yeah. advocacy. It was two thousand and three when we had our first inaugural meeting and set up the steering committee and I was the first uh, uh, co-chair, co we had a, decided to have a male and female co-chair, eventually got the constitution registered in Fiji. Lato and I went over, we've always done things right from the beginning, right from carrying furniture and arranging the meeting room, so then we were going out buying dishes and tea towels and for the office and stationery and the first furniture yeah. and uh, setting it, I plugged in the modem and Zuba. Yeah. All of these sort of um, hands-on, very hands-on hands stuff is yeah. sometimes not really seen as a domain where blind people would end up being. Yeah, we'd, um, we'd, we'd done it right from the beginning, even going back to the 80s when when the um, when we'd meet together, you know, to at the at uh, associations rooms, we'd go around and pick up the key from Cyril White for the meeting room and open up the the house that where the association was located in Titoki Street and set out the mattresses and arrange the food and all this kind of things. Even going back to that um, computer programming course, technology was always a you know, really big thing for me and, and so much a part of making sure that I could be totally as independent and productive as possible. I'm still to this day, you know, looking out for new technologies and new ways to do things more effectively and efficiently as a manager for, for Vision Pacific Trust and uh, but also for other DPOs that can use it. That's yeah. great. Mm. A key part of your philosophy within the Pacific Disability Forum was that it should be disabled yes. people led, right? Yeah, it does, yeah, definitely. Yeah. What we're seeing now is that we're getting organisations that can actually mentor or train other disability organisations and um, within their so countries they don't just well. have to look to, say, us here in New Zealand or in Australia as the 
as the ones that you know have got the experience because actually a lot of them have got experience too. They've been able to um, to train the office managers and then also run programs for for the chair of the board or the executive committee and um, learn about keeping keeping proper books and that sort of thing. Mm. So. And that's great, right? Because mm. that's a huge step change from like 20 yeah. years ago when that's you would have been starting. Yeah. So they are now resources to the region, some of mm. those organisations. Over the course of your advocacy, I don't know if you would have thought of it in sort of long-term change um, paradigm ways, but is that something that you can kind of look back on now and think about as something quite satisfying that these organisations are a yes, lot better. Yes, for sure. It's very satisfying to see. With all of these sort of governance and technological and um, skills that you helped sort of the um, Pacific organisations to get, can you just give me a, a few examples of the sorts of things that these organisations would advocate for? Everything from um, act, you know, getting access to education, so make sure that their their kids with disabilities go to school and can participate in the uh, curriculum to the best of their ability. They have different projects in their countries, in their island countries, about making sure that people with disabilities are included in discussions about how to respond in times of disaster, because of course our, our island countries have earthquakes, volcanoes, weather events, you know, floods and things like that. So they could talk to their their different ministries about uh, the needs of um, deaf people needing to have access to sign language interpreters in order to make their make their needs known at the hospital or wherever they're getting, um, you know, where they need to access services, health services. Mm. Um, access to justice, where people who have psychosocial disability may be, mis you know, may be mistreated because they're picked up and and seen as a as a nuisance, or they're not um, they're not treated humanely, and that's meant the start of um, organisations that will advocate for for their their point of view, their their rights as um, people with psychosocial disabilities. Mm. And what would you say to maybe younger people now who are kind of um, not sure if they want to, you know, do advocacy mm. like in our lives or, you know, we're all doing a hundred different things and is it something that it's worth making time for given that, you know, a lot has been done and a lot has gotten better? Yeah, that's a tricky one because you see it, you know, and, and, and I was probably... Um, you know, because yeah, there's so so much now for young people to get involved with. If they haven't had any exposure to disability or you know um, other pe people with disability, then um, it's probably not occurred. You know, it wouldn't occur to a person to to um, start look seeking out or finding you know or being involved with other other um, disabled people. So it is quite, that is a challenge, how to, you know, how to enthuse or involve young people. But when I'd left school, you know, sport yeah. was sort of a way to engage with people without yeah. being right, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And then you see the need or the, you, you find out through, through engaging in sports that, oh, wow, you know, there's uh, other other ways of doing things so it's probably a matter of just identifying you know coming up with a way to that will engage people where they want to be you know youth yeah. engage youth where they want to be yeah um one of my first interactions with lots of blind people was when i was 11 at a braille music camp in australia mm. for example and that See, was music really that's another way for example mm. yeah the solomon was, islands mm -hmm. they started a band yeah. Um, Teto Mato in um, Kiribati, they have a band and they do even more. They do like, you know, street dramas and things like that that mm. involve not only uh, not only blind people, but people with other impairments. Yeah. And um, what, what kind of keeps you going, you know, with the advocacy stuff? Because you've obviously been doing it for a really long time and it must get 
does it does it feel like it gets a bit monotonous after a while or is there a type of change um, that you can sort of see happening or something that keeps you motivated you know my day job so to speak is um that we have a support independent living contract that's such a positive area to be in it's sort of like you know because you're you know look you're working with a person to achieve their identified goals that they want to achieve in their in the plan that we help write up with them in partnership with them we've always had this philosophy i say we again as i talk and i because as a partnership you know we've always done things together and but we have we have a shared philosophy that we can work at that individual level we've got we've also we also see the value in working at the group level, whether it's setting up a peer support group, be belonging to a, a club, belonging to an advocacy organisation, and then there's the other, there's the international stage, lobbying government to make changes that we see that affect individuals' lives, and then as a group we can um, work in to make submissions and contribute to the discussions on uh, on making changes to laws and so on at the national and then and, and international level. Which is quite a contrast from the like, what, did, what was it, dictaphone typing <laughs> job that you were supposed to be doing in the yeah. 70s as a blind woman, right? Mm. And that set of expectations. Yeah. Thank um, goodness I'd got away from that. <laughs> thank goodness, because look at all the things that <laughs> you've been able to set up when you got away mm. from that. Um, maybe I Others might be encouraged by what I've done or what I've been doing and maybe try things too. And that's, you just got to give it a go, I think. In conversation with Tuai Skipwith Halato, the music is Siva by June. Development and funding thanks to Imagine Better. Edited by Juliana Machado. Visual direction by Benjamin Brooking. Produced by Anya Kelly Costello.